But now hand over to Councillor Sarah Rai Arais to introduce the next session. Thank you. Um, thank you. Yes, so my name's um, Sarah Race. I'm a councillor at uh, Mornington Peninsula Shire. Um, we're probably not known for our great public transport, but it's a work in progress. Um, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce Anthony Cross. Um, Anthony implemented a number of transformational public transport projects in Auckland between 2003 and 2019, which led to a doubling of PT patronage in that period. The new network was the name given to the complete restructure of the city's bus system between 2016 and 2019, which complemented the electrification of the city's rail network, the building of a major busway and several major interchanges, the introduction of integrated fares and ticketing, and reform of the bus service procurement system. Please join me in welcoming Anthony Cross. Hello, uh, kia ora koutou. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Um, I'm tr am trying to share the presentation, but having a bit of trouble with that. Okay. Um, I'm assuming you can uh, hear me okay? Yes, we can. And can see the presentation? No, I can't see the presentation yet. <clears throat> okay. Try now. See it now? Very good. No, no, I said try now, please. Oh, yeah, that seems okay. to be working. Yeah. Great. And Is full that working okay? Please. All good? Yep, if you can go. Yep, that's great. Perfect. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, uh, everybody. Uh, and it's great to be able to join you um, today. Um, I'm just wanting to uh, talk to you today about the uh, Auckland New Network that was implemented several years ago. Um, and um, to, I guess, um, talk about some of the things we learned and some of the things maybe we, we would do slightly differently if we were doing the exercise again. So just a bit of context um, for you, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Auckland and for its uh, governance, I suppose. Um, uh, <clears throat> Auckland is about a third the size of Melbourne in terms of population. Um, it has a single local government uh, organisation, Auckland Council, um, which replaced a number of councils in 2010. And as part of that reorganisation, Auckland Transport was created as a council controlled organisation with responsibility for all public transport uh, in the Auckland region, as well as for <coughs> uh, all, all of the roads and streets. So um, <clears throat> Auckland has, ha has <laughs> historically had a reputation for for being having pretty poor public transport, but we had over the last 20 years or so um, <clears throat> made very significant progress in terms of public transport infrastructure. Um, <clears throat> and that resulted in pr prior to COVID in doubling public transport patronage um, over a period of about 15 years, uh, 10 to 15 years, which resulted in 100 million journeys per year. Um, as you can see, um, uh, the vast majority of public transport continues to be by bus in Auckland. Um, that's <clears throat> to some extent because Auckland's rail network is very, very tiny. So if you can see on this map here, um, there are only three main rail routes, the red southern line from the central city extending south, obviously, and then parallel to that, a little bit hard to see on this map, uh, there's a yellow line which um, goes out to the east through Panmure, rejoins the southern line for some distance, and then branches to the east to Monaco, and then the green line uh, going out to the west. So there are, there are no rail services um, uh, north of the harbour, and, and large parts of Auckland have, uh, are quite remote from the rail network. Um, <clears throat> 
currently in Auckland, we have 50 bus operating contracts. Um, we now have only four private companies um, operating about 1,200 buses uh, across the city. So we went through, we had a change of legislation 10 years ago, um, which resulted in all, all bus services being contracted in the Auckland region. That was national legislation, which replaced the previous um, uh, system based on UK uh, deregulation, which was implemented in 1991, um, which was a very confusing mixture of commercial and contracted services. So the, the biggest, uh, advantage of that 2013 legislation was the ability uh, to plan the entire network um, because uh, all services were transitioned into those new contracts. In terms of funding, uh, in New Zealand there was a requirement for public transport to uh, meet 50% of its operating costs through fares. Uh, the, the rest from local government rates and national funding through Waka Kotahi, the, the New Zealand Transport Agency. Um, under the Labour-led government that we've had over the last six years, that 50% funding um, has been allowed to lapse and obviously COVID uh, impacted on, on that hugely. Um, so it remains to be seen with the change of government that we're going into um, what the impact will be in terms of public transport funding. So in, it, in terms of Auckland's urban form, um, very, very similar, I guess. <clears throat> Auckland, Auckland's geography is very similar to Sydney, so very different from Melbourne in that it's very broken up by bodies of water and so forth. But um, you will recognise, I'm sure, on these images, the, the older suburbs this, on the left-hand side, the suburbs pretty much immediately to the south of the city centre, um, which were which developed really along, along the tram routes. Um, so we still refer to tram suburbs in Auckland, the ones developed before the Second World War. On the right, um, part of the North Shore, which is very um, much focused on, on the mobility of, of the car. <clears throat> so this image shows um, our northern busway, uh, parallel to the northern motorway north of the Harbour Bridge, and um, the bus route required to serve um, a major um, <clears throat> urban focus at Albany on the North Shore. So very much uh, less focused on public transport um, in terms of the road layout, um, the configuration of the suburbs. So in a 2012, we embarked, uh, following the, the creation of Auckland Transport, we embarked on um, a new network uh, for the bus system. And that was very much intended to um, capitalise on the investment that had been made on the rail network over a number of years and on the Northern Busway. So it required a number of uh, major interchanges to be constructed. Um, we needed to implement uh, integrated fares and ticketing, which um, we hadn't had until that until 2016. Um, and we were very focused on minimising duplication between buses and the trains and uh, <clears throat> in terms of the outer suburbs. So we actually um, ended up removing direct bus services to and from the city centre for many, many suburbs, especially in the outer parts of Auckland. Um, we reduced, uh, significantly reduced the number of bus routes um, without greatly impacting on, on coverage. Um, we also introduced more than 30 frequent bus services, which are defined as operating at least every 15 minutes, 7 a.m. till 7 p.m., seven days a week. Only about half of those run into and out of the city centre. The other, the other half uh, are cross suburban services or services that operate wholly within, for example, West Auckland or South Auckland. Um, we did increase bus service kilometres as we introduced the new network by about a third. And although we uh, we were careful not to assume that we would have an increase in patronage as we rolled out the new network. We did actually 
in each sector see an increase in patronage almost immediately. So in terms of the theory that we were trying to put into practice, um, we had a very, very complex bus network in Auckland. Um, and uh, so on the left-hand side, you can see that there were, there were lots of individual routes um, con connecting all sorts of uh, destinations. On the right-hand side, we rationalized the route structure um, building on a number of uh, suburban interchanges that were built around Auckland. Um, so a much smaller number of bus routes, but uh, each of them having a much more consistent level of service and without loss of coverage. Another way of talking about that was to, to look in terms of, on the, on the left-hand side, a very coverage-based network, um, Lots of roads and streets have sort of equivalent levels of service. On the right-hand side, um, fewer routes, um, but higher levels of service, which people are generally uh, happy to, to walk uh, further to access. Now, that's a continuum, and um, we still have coverage services in our Auckland network, um, but the core services are, are much stronger and more prominent. So to give you an example from one part of South Auckland, on the left, you can see on the map there, an extremely complicated um, bus network. Um, and that doesn't include every route in that part of town. This is how we rationalised it. Um, the thick lines on this map are the ones that operate uh, every 15 minutes, 7am 7 till 7, 7 till 7pm, 7 7 days a week. Um, and uh, to enable uh, transfer, this, this part of town used to have services running all the way into, um, into central Auckland. Uh, now it has only one limited service doing that. The rest are providing much stronger connections locally within South Auckland, um, but uh, connecting with the trains at a new interchange that was opened at Otahu in 2016. So what was very, very important for us as we went through the process was to have a very strong uh, engagement and consultation process. Um, we had a dedicated engagement team working uh, alongside the planners, uh, and that was the team that I was responsible for. At one stage, we had about 20 people, roughly half were planners and half were communications staff. But... Um, what worked really, really well for us was that the, the, the communication staff became well versed in public transport planning, well familiar with each part of Auckland as we were working on the network. Um, and, and likewise, the planners um, upped their skills considerably in terms of their ability to communicate and to engage with local communities. Um, so I would, I would certainly highly recommend that um, having uh, a dedicated engagement team uh, is really was really really critical for us, um, and I had to fight quite hard to keep um, to to keep that team um, focused solely on this project, uh, rather than being distracted onto other projects like road safety or whatever might have been priorities priorities elsewhere in the organisation. Um, obviously, there was um, a lot of engagement with our councillors, MPs, and in Auckland, as well as having a single council, there are actually 21 local boards which are elected, um, and we needed to engage with each and every one of those on a regular basis as well. Um, <clears throat> all of our um, consultation uh, material, including our, our feedback summaries, are still available on, on the Auckland Transport website and um, may, be, may be of interest in terms of how we um, went through the process of um, consulting on getting feedback and responding to it. Um, so very much um, we were focused obviously on our existing customers, um, but we were also creating this new network in order to attract new customers in the future. Um, our, our engagement and consultation also needed to include non-customers um, who, are, who are going to be affected by the changes. And that includes um, the likes of retailers, um, uh, 
people who would, would, would have bus stops outside their premises and that sort of thing, uh, as well as people who would have buses in their street for the first time. So the implementation was obviously very, very important. And at that stage, retaining our existing bus users uh, was the most important uh, focus. Um, a huge uh, scale of change, given that many suburbs lost their direct services into central Auckland. Um, in some cases, we even had to, to reassure people who would be using trains for the first time. Um, an important uh, learning, I guess, was um, that there is no substitute for um, getting out onto the street, um, having direct uh, engagement with people face to face, um, handing them slips of paper, um, not uh, resisting the temptation to do everything um, digitally. Um, we were under some pressure to, 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 to use iPads, for example, but it's just not fast enough in terms of uh, connecting with people on the ground um, when you're about to implement change and as you do implement change. This uh, slide just shows an example of the impact of doing um, very, very targeted marketing um, in a particular suburb. Uh, this is about 30 kilometres north of Auckland, um, brand new suburbs um, where new and, and increased services were introduced um, and the team got out and um, did let, <coughs> letterbox drops, um, uh, flyers on uh, windscreens at the park and ride facility at the, at the bus station, um, uh, social media that was very focused on the neighbourhood, um, all sorts of um, ways of engaging directly with possible users of, of the bus service. And when the frequency of the service in this new suburb was doubled, um, it was met with an immediate 40% increase in patronage, which was very gratifying. So as I said, um, it's really important to uh, connect with existing and make sure that existing customers are uh, kept on board. That is obviously not always possible and, and some people will be uh, disadvantaged by the changes you make as you as you change a network. Um, but for the most part, we were able to keep our existing customers happy. But the focus, the reason why you're doing a network review is to, to create a product which is gonna be much more um, relevant and useful to many more people. And so selling the network to those people is obviously vitally important and something which I have to say, I don't think has been done particularly well in the case of Auckland. Um, Prioritising connections um, in, the, in, in the network, given it is a connected multimodal network. Um, and that's something that I think uh, needs a lot more attention uh, and uh, could have been done better in Auckland. Um, I'm just aware of time, so I'll speed up just a little bit about um, infrastructure. Um, this is obviously a, a very extreme example of a bus, bus stop um, somewhere in North, North America, but it's really, really important that um, in terms of infrastructure, um, every bus stop is important. It's not just about the flash new interchanges we do we've we've done um probably 10 or 12 major new interchanges across Auckland and we've done those reasonably well I think but there needs to be um much more of a focus on on the individual bus stops that um, people use this is the new standard Auckland suburban bus stop and this one is what is in one of the poorer parts of town just very recently um constructed so buses need uh, champions, and I think um, you know it. It it's probably buses are not um, the the most popular mode of public transport generally. Um, so um, we need needed to rely on elected members in Auckland. Um, we um, didn't formally have champions in terms of elected members, although some elected members definitely did stand, um, 
stand up and 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 take uh, take a leading role in helping people in their communities to understand the changes that we were making and and what the benefits would be. Um, but it is really important to challenge some of the very negative perceptions around bus as a mode of, of transport. So just some reflections uh, uh, quickly. I think it's really important to recognize that um, there are people in the system um, uh, as well as in the advocacy community who do deeply understand public transport and the relationship with the city that you're trying to trying to serve and um, those people need uh, a lot of encouragement at times um, but it's it's really important to take advantage of of the people who who are very very familiar with what the issues are uh, so in terms of what 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 went well in Auckland? Um, the the review of the bus network was 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 just one element, and a whole lot of uh, other projects, including electrifying uh, our rail system, duplicating, providing double tracking in some cases, building um, major interchanges, uh, integrating fares and ticketing that I've talked about, a complete review of of the procurement system. Um, so it was quite the challenge to in integrate the, the new network rollout into all of those other things that were happening and making sure that everything happened um, in, the, in the right order. <clears throat> um, really important uh, in terms of what could be done better, as, I, as I've said, I think uh, once the network has been put in place, um, it, it's important to focus on going out and, and reaching as many people as possible who would benefit from the system, recognizing that uh, the, the system won't work for everybody, but there are many people who for whom much improved services might be beneficial. Uh, buses are, as I said, tend to be the pretty much the poor relation in terms of public transport. And so there's a, there's a lot of work to be done in terms of um, challenging some of those uh, negative uh, perceptions, a negative mindset, and thinking about whether or not um, we are, the, the resources we're putting into bus as a mode and how that stacks up against, against rail and ferry in particular. And in Auckland, I don't think we've got, um, I'm certainly not advocating against um, rail investment. I'm a huge advocate for that. Um, but on a per capita basis, there tends to be a lot more invested in, in, in rail than, than in bus as a mode. And lastly, um, just a challenge, I guess, to think about the network. Um, I think it's very, very important that we embed network thinking in all of our all of our public transport work, not just at the planning stage, but in terms of um, uh, operationally, how we operate the network, how we enable, for example, connections to be made between buses or between buses and trains or buses and trams or whatever, um, in terms of how we communicate the network and, it, and its potential and its opportunities. Um, how we assess it, how we review it at every stage to think that uh, it is not about individual services operating in isolation, but it is very much about uh, oper operating a network that um, needs to be well integrated and well communicated with the people it's designed to serve. Uh, a couple of reading suggestions here from North America. Jarrett Walker's Human Transit is a great book to read if you're able to get a copy of that. And likewise, from North America, Stephen Higashid's uh, Better Buses, Better Cities. Um, very North American, obviously, that, but but those those both those books are, um, are very challenging and useful. So I'll end it there. Um, a bit of a gallop, really, but um, I'm certainly happy to take take some questions.
Um, thanks, Anthony. That was a really interesting presentation. Um, I actually uh, like the idea about having an ambassador. I thought that was really clever and something that we could possibly <laughs> take on. Um, I've got a question to kick off while people are thinking what their questions might be. Um, if you are renegotiating bus contracts, what single metric would you add? What, which, what's... Single metric, metric. Would you, single metric would you add if you were negotiating bus contracts? Um, I would probably go back to um, uh, one around that that was focused on that um, obviously customer cust the customer experience if you like and um, for me that thing about the network is really really important so finding ways in which the bus contract is not all about um, uh, operating a particular service in isolation now th this is a real challenge and I'm not I'm not sure that uh, we certainly haven't found the answer in Auckland um, but um, finding ways in which the bus bus services can be operated um, uh, so that um, those network connections and 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 things like transfer so we're probably all familiar with the idea that a late running train might might arrive at a station for example and the bus uh, that people are needing to connect to has 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 already driven off or drives drives away just as passengers are, are getting off the train so um, that that's something that I would I would tend to fo focus on. Excellent, thank you. Um, so ready to take questions? Yeah, I just was wondering. Uh, you talked about people not picking up the service; they've dropped off. How much are they? Uh, what percentage of those people are people with disabilities that you seem not to have mentioned at all? Uh, you mean people who? Um, may have been disadvantaged by the changes? Well, those people that uh, you've took, you, the bus services don't exist anymore that you've taken away from with disabilities, they can't get on those services now. What what are they doing now? Yeah, um, I, I just wanted to emphasise, I suppose, that um, there's, there's very, very, very few pl uh, places in Auckland that used to have a bus service uh, that, that don't still have one. And um, although I've, I've probably... Um, uh, emphasised the importance of the frequent network and and the and the connections to and from the rail network, for example. Um, most parts of Auckland, even those even even minor bus routes, have substantially better, uh, more frequent services and better coverage than they used to have. So um, there would be very very few people in Auckland, dis those with disabilities or not. Who would argue that they have um, less service or than they used to have, or or or, or no service at all? Uh, and obviously, uh, you know, the the um, the renewal of the bus fleet that was associated with the new network meant that, in terms of physical access, you know, our bus fleet is now is obviously um, wheelchair accessible, pretty pretty much across the board. Um, and so, uh, I don't think that there, it, there's any particular disadvantage to the disabled community. I mean, it, it remains a focus, obviously. Uh, it always needs to be because if, if public transport is accessible for um, people with disabilities, then it's, it's, it's more accessible for everybody as well. Thanks, Anthony. My name's Laura Aston. I'm from Movement in Place. Uh, a question for you is, how did you justify the major uplift in spend on community engagement that you mentioned? Obviously, you recognise it would be make or break, but how did you get that to translate into funding? Um, it, it, can, it was a constant struggle, I have to say. Um, um, and in, in thinking back, um, you know, we yeah, it was it was it was a, a struggle. I th I think um, you know I can't remember the, the the details now, but I think the the evidence is there. Like, that's why I would I would probably encourage you to look at some of the material that was produced, um, which. 
you know, it's kind of evidence that um, it was worth doing in terms of the, um, for example, we were able to, to, we have a good evidence base in terms of the feedback we received and the changes we made as a, as a result of that feedback. Um, we got it. We got a better outcome, and that that translated into um, not only retaining um, most of our existing customers, but in in having immediate uplift in terms of improved patronage. So, um, it's. I think our case study is is probably quite useful in terms of helping um, others to build to build the case for investing reasonably heavily in engagement and consultation. Sorry, that's not an exact answer to your question, but um, hope, hopefully that's helpful. Um, I've got a question from uh, uh, online um, audience. Um, Simon Stainsby, he has two questions. I'll start with one. Um, as a local government rep with 700 bus stops in his municipality, most of which are DSAPT 2002 compliant, how can I make bus stop improvements a state priority? Um, yeah, I'm not sure that that's one I can, I can answer, but um, I just I, I guess from from my perspective, I think getting the balance right between minor public transport infrastructure and major public transport infrastructure is really important. And I think it's worth looking at, you know, in terms of the vast majority of people using public transport in any given day. Um, will be will probably be using a relatively minor um, bus stop tram stop whatever um, at at one end of their journey um, and uh, making sure that each and every bus stop is accessible not just in this in the sense of you know for people with disabilities but for example how easy is it to get to and from a bus stop if if it's on a main road you know safe access, uh, across the road. I can think of many examples in Auckland where bus stops are on either side of a very busy arterial road and it's really um, quite a challenge to cross that road if if there haven't been safe access um, across the road. So um, once again it's you know coming back to the, the, the stops as part of the network and and just constantly questioning whether whether the um, the balance is right between um, uh, infrastructure at different at, at different extremes. Uh, into, you know the, the the major interchanges we tend to focus on, but super important to to think about all of the stops in the network. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Councillor McNeil. I'm the Accessibility Ambassador. Um, just wondered how the uh, the engagement went with um, uh, disability groups, uh, people who are vision impaired, people who are um, hearing impaired and things like that, people with uh, maybe limited um, communication or um, understanding mm -hmm. sort of um, things like intellectual disability as well. Uh, and how's that gone in terms of um, how you communicate with those people um, in terms of the transport that turns up now, um, first of all, yep. So in terms of the transport that uh, turns up, in, in know, knowing those communities, knowing what where, what sort of transport is actually going to turn up and, and that it's accessible. Yeah, sure. I mean, um, there's always, always room for um, Im improvement in, in with every community. I mean, we did put a lot of effort in terms of making sure that we were in contact with um, you know, disability organisations across the board and community organisations as much as possible. Um, of, I'm sure we could have done a lot, a lot better. Um, it's, it's very uh, uh, resource intensive, I suppose, uh, or people intensive to, to make sure that you're reaching um, all of those communities and their representative organisations, but um, and, and it's something that can never be a one-off either. It needs to be continuous 
and continuous effort and a continuous focus. And I certainly wouldn't say that that um, that there is enough uh, emphasis on that in in Auckland or in, in New Zealand. It's not for you know there's 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 a a political and an organisational desire to do those things really really well, but there's not always the the the, the I suppose the uh, the funding and the resources to to make sure that that's done as well as it possibly could be. Oh, Anthony, um, hi, Bernadette Thomas from Maribyrnong City Council. Um, you mentioned a couple of times um, needing to do more to attract the potential customers and, uh, you know, you had a little quote up there around, about how can I live in the city without a car. Um, mm. what, what things didn't you do that you think you should have done or might be now doing in sort of post all of that work to attract those people who are now on those new upgraded frequent lovely 777 routes but are still not catching the bus? Yeah, great. Um, great question. I mean, I think um, that, that that's a real um, challenge because each, um, it, it requires an effort within each community across a big city. Um, and so um, people have, can often have very, very out of date perceptions. Well, it's certainly a case in Auckland, which had, you know, several decades of having very, very poor public transport in perception and in reality. And so uh, for Auckland, as it requires a, a significant, you know, challenge to that, that, that mentality that, that build up over many decades. Um, I don't know what the answer is, except to say that it re requires more than a kind of superficial branding or um, or advertising campaign. Um, it my my view is it needs to be very focused on community, so um, engaging with um, local representatives. In Auckland's case, that that would be the the, lo the local boards. Um, uh, but v being very, very targeted around the the individual parts of the network, um, and finding ways to 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 communicate um, the advantages, being also very upfront about the fact that you know we're not suggesting that you know people will say that you know that people have to use public transport. All of the customer market research that I ever saw when I was at Auckland Transport would, would would always identify that there was a significant sector of the population who were open to using public transport or using it more um, if it was if it was more useful for for them. And that that is the sector um, as opposed to the people who are kind of dependent on public transport already and who are already using it. And as as distinct from people who are never going to be interested, um, so it's it's about finding clever ways to engage with those people who are who are open to using public transport. Um, and as I say, I don't think a citywide um, so, um, um, communications plan is necessary. I think it needs to be very localized, very targeted on specific communities. Yeah, Tom Mulligan, City of Banyul. Um, my question is around the operational costs. Um, we've done, um, City of Melbourne or Adam Wyndham, they've done similar things where they've straightened up networks, increased frequency without actually increasing the operating costs. Can you comment on, mm. you know, basically very similar to what you've done, but you've done it over a whole city. Can you question about they increased the frequency, but what was the impact on the operating costs? Did they need more buses? Did they need more drivers? Or was it virtually cost neutral to do these changes? Um, it it was it was originally intended that it would be um, pretty much cost neutral. Um, it became apparent that that wasn't going to be it wasn't going to be possible to um, to do it. There there was going to be a, a need for not so much more buses in the fleet, but more. Um, 
more operating costs in terms of um, operating hours. Uh, and I think I, I mentioned it, it was it ended up being approximately a 35% um, increase in bus service kilometers. Um, but it was partly um, partly due to other factors other than the network um, the network project. For example, um, in bearing in mind this was pre-COVID, there was increasing peak demand, and there was a desire to uh, to add um, buses and and drivers to to meet peak demand. Um, I'm sure you're um, familiar with the concept of March Madness, and the idea was that. Um, we, you know, we we needed to keep on top of March Madness each year and and ensure that there were enough buses to meet peak demand at that time of the year. So the allocation of resources was was increasing anyway. Um, but one of the ironies, um, as it, following on from COVID, is that peak demand has. Um, you know, is 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 much reduced, and so there is a project going on in Auckland at the moment to to reallocate some of those peak resources to um, to provide more service across um, the middle of the day, for example. And of course, that that will end up um, improving the efficiency of the network overall as um, demand and supply um, flattens. Um, it, uh, across across the day is is less heavily peaked, um, but but yes, in Auckland we did have to, to 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 acknowledge and face up to the fact that we did need to provide um, more buses, more more drivers uh, uh, across the day in order to provide these improved levels of service. And I guess I guess that goes to my point about. Buses as a as a mode um, um, relative to to rail, for example. So um, that you know, on a per capita basis, um, you know, the the spend on, in terms of bus is still well below the spend on on rail. Um, thank you, Anthony. I've got one last question from um, our online viewers. I'm just checking the room. No more questions. So Simon gets the last question. Um, I'm going to adapt it a bit, Simon. Um, Simon's um, basically asking about uh, what uh, the arrangements to support the bus to train transfer spaces. So you've spoken a bit about making sure the network functions well in terms of the conversations on the buses don't leave as the trains are arriving. But I think Simon's question is also around the actual physical location and um, perhaps if you can tell us a little bit about what was done in Auckland to improve those bus to train transfer spaces. Sure. Um, yeah, I guess one of the um, advantages of of rail being of Auckland being very late to the rail party, um, <laughs> bearing in mind that you know as recently as um, um, thirty years ago, there was a real prospect that Auckland's rail network would be closed down entirely. So um, there has been a lot of investment in in relatively major um, bus train interchanges in various parts of Auckland, um, and so they're obviously pur purpose built. Um, they're not they're not all perfect, and obviously they've got um, th there's always um, uh, lessons to be learned as each one is built that that um, in ensure that the the next one that's built is is better still. Um, uh, so, but there are there are other part other places in the network where bus train uh, interchange happens, um, and um, you know the, the quality of those the, those interchanges is obviously a variable. Um, uh, and and a, just not this one is not bus train, but one of my. Um, uh, I think bus to bus transfers are, are a really important part of the network as well. Um, not always at formal interchanges, but where, um, for example, frequent services cross over each other at right angles. Um, there's a lot of work to be done to to make those sorts of transfers um, a lot easier. Lot easier. And I and I look at the 
many examples in North American cities where where even on very very busy arterial roads, they will prioritise the stops being really close to the intersections to minimise the transfer distances. Whereas in Auckland, um, uh, at major intersections, the bus stops tend to have been moved well away from the interchanges in order to to enable um, traffic throughput, but very much to the disadvantage of people attempting to to transfer from one bus to another. Um, where a couple of routes cross over each other. So that is still something that needs to happen in Auckland to improve those sorts of uh, interchanges. And, and, and I would say that in the case of Melbourne with many, many long straight roads uh, and, and a, a much more effective grid system uh, than Auckland will ever have, um, there's numerous uh, locations, probably hundreds of locations across Melbourne where, where bus routes crossing at each other at right angles uh, are opportunities for interchange where um, uh, remodeling those inter intersections to to enable easy transfer between buses um, uh, w would be a would be a potential solution thank you very much Anthony yeah, thank you, Anthony. Um, I'd just like you um, just like to give you a clap today. Thank you again. Sorry, that was really badly worded. Um, and now.